Next topic of uh, Tech Field Day is the cloud. And uh, this is a, a, a pretty exciting announcement for us. We've been working on, on something for uh, just over a year now, and, uh, and we're ready to kind of announce it to the world. And uh, so I, I want to start off, though, by, by talking about the cloud and, and talking about some challenges that you face in the cloud. Um, and, and honestly, I think a lot of you delegates probably could explain some of these better than I could even. But, just you know, keys. Just keys. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of challenges in, in moving, moving to the cloud when you have an on-premises IT environment. You know, you have, first of all, the fact that it is a new environment to learn. It's, it's, uh, it is, you know, it, it's not a huge obstacle, but it's there, right? You have to learn. You have to pick a, a cloud provider. You have to learn that particular environment. You have to understand, uh, you know, the, the, the billing components of it and, and et cetera. And it's, it's, uh, it, there's a learning curve there. Uh, you know, secondly, you know, do you go with cloud native applications and containers? Uh, you can, but again, now you're talking about changing applications. You're, you're talking about a large just process of moving from your existing applications to new applications. And uh, you know, there's just a lot of investment necessary there in, in time and resources to, to make that change. Uh, another sort of approach is do you try to run your existing apps in the cloud? That's another possibility. But then you have other questions that come up. How do you manage the networking of that? How do I make um, a particular VM running in the cloud communicate with resources that might be running locally on my network? How do my users reach the app in the cloud, et cetera? And then a great use case for the cloud is, is disaster recovery. How do you do that via the cloud? Right? If my building burns down, like tends to happen around here, uh, <laughs> we've had two fires here, if anyone was wondering. Um, you know, how do you, how do you do this via the cloud? And, uh, and, and again, networking is a huge question there. Um, you look at a, a, D, a typical DR runbook for uh, a cloud disaster recovery scenario and 80% of that is managing networking. How do you now plumb everything through to the cloud? How do you change DNS, change IPs on these virtual machines? The virtual machines need to have, uh, you know, two NICs configured, one for failover, one for primary, so that when you fail it over, you're failing over to a second virtual NIC that's got a, a separate IP address configured, et cetera. You know, there's, there's a lot to think through when you're, when you're planning these things out. So we wanted to, to kind of make this easier. So how do you easily leverage the cloud? You know, we're all about ease of use, as Jeff, you saw with Jeff's uh, demonstration. Uh, we want to make it as easy as possible for, especially for small IT environments where, uh, you know, it's, it's important for things to be, to be easy. So, what we wanted to do is make the cloud feel as though it is the same exact thing as what you have locally. It just happens to be running in the cloud. And we want it to be as familiar as possible uh, to, to the users who have already used HC3. We want it to essentially be HC3 in the cloud. So that's what we've created. So today we are introducing what we're calling HC3 Cloud Unity. And this is done through a partnership with Google, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about as well. So what is HC3 Cloud Unity? It is full-featured HC3 running in the cloud, which means it's not only just a tape drive in the sky where you're just sending data, expecting to be able to get it back somehow, someday. It is, you, you have the ability to run a VM in the cloud. You can, you can fail over to it. You can have workloads running in, in both places that communicate via the same network. Um, you know, we have, built-in secure networking so that you, ha you have no need to have a separate VPN. And uh, you know, those, those workloads in the cloud effectively appear as though they are on your local LAN on your, at your site. And, and that's a pretty cool feature, which I'll, I'll demo here in a second. The idea here is that you, you actually have seamless DR with full failover capability without you really requiring to do anything special to these VMs to set them up to run in the cloud. If, you've, if it's already running on HC3, it will run in the cloud. So as I mentioned, HC3 Cloud Unity is implemented on the Google Cloud Platform. Um, you know, and for scale in Google, this, this sort of uh, partnership made a lot of sense because HC3 runs on KVM, Google runs on KVM. So that made this implementation very straightforward. So and is Scribe running on GCP or is yes. this? So it's not nested? 
It is nested. Okay. Uh, you got right to my next, my next bullet point here, is that uh, today Google announced nested virtualization, and we are taking advantage of that. And we've been working on uh, day one. On day one. Yeah. We've been working together on this for just over a year. So I've got uh, Scott Van Woodenberg here uh, from Google, and uh, he is the uh, product manager for uh, Google Compute Engine. So. I, I just came up to say a few quick things about the partnership. Yeah, like we, like uh, Phil said, we have been working with Scale for a little over a year, collaborating on this feature. It was like before we even had it, uh, we were uh, before we were thinking about implementing it. We were talking to Scale about requirements, and they were one of the first people we had in our early access program to help us flesh out the bugs and and really, you know, e explore the technology and help get better performance out of it and stuff. And so it's been a great partnership. And there's so, like you were, you were, as Phil was saying, there's a lot of synergy NVMe uh, that w which we have available on our local SSD devices. The the K they, the fact that it's based on KVM. Yeah, I mean, it's just like all the slides I've been watching go through. There's there's just so much oh, like so much overlap. Yeah. it's great. So it's been a great partnership. But back to you. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of cool stuff that we can really do with this, just uh, just given the the sort of natural synergies between the technologies. So, um, so just to go through a couple disaster scenarios. This is we're talking about disaster recovery, uh, sort of as a service now. This is uh, the the traditional. Are we going to come back to architecture? Uh, we can. Well, what what architecture? Well, you but go ahead and ask a question if if you'd like. So the the secure network. Yep. Are you stretching the layer two net? Is that you? We are. VXLAN so, encapsulated. VXLAN. Yeah, we're doing VXLAN encapsulation. Oh. So uh, I can across. have VMs running in Google that come back across that and out through my firewall so that I can still keep track of what they're doing. Yes. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have to keep doing things right, don't you? <laughs> Did your mind just That's get blown? That's what we try to do, but. <laughs> What's that? Is your mind blown? <laughs> no, I mean, I understand it. It's just two years faster than I expected. Yeah, it's, uh, it's it, that in particular, what you've mentioned is a very cool technology. Well, I mean, stretch V2 yeah. lands like that are a dumpster fire for a bunch of other reasons. Mm -hmm. But this is like everything people have been claiming about Metro Cluster, except I don't need two data centers. So, damn. Yeah, I, I remember the, uh, the first time I actually saw this work, it kind of blew my mind, right? And I, I was, uh, we had an early prototype of this, and I was, I was running it at home. And uh, I, I brought up a, a Linux VM in the cloud and saw that it grabbed a DHCP address. <laughs> And uh, from your home router, from my home router, <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's effectively on my home network, and I'm yeah. just like, wow, that's cool, right? You just to see that happen for the first time, it's it's uh, it was cool. So that's kind of that's what's at work here, right? And so uh, I'm just gonna skip through this. This is a traditional DR scenario. Okay, but so the data is all stored in Google's equivalent of EBS, right? Yeah, that's correct. I, I, that, right. Sorry, I don't just don't remember all your terminology. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Is there any way to take advantage of the object blob store for lower cost? Um, Can you export we, we snapshots? <laughs> I mean, those are certainly possibilities that, that we but, can do. And but we can not day explore. one. Not day one, no. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did, yeah. Please, please don't take this as you no, I, I understand. how little yeah. you guys have done, and you know, it's kind of like I'm really <laughs> impressed where you are, but I want more. That's no, that's a great, that's a great idea. I mean, that's like Phil's saying. There's a, there's a lot of opportunity there of for taking advantage of that. Well, the and backups. And snap, one of the one of the things shots. a lot of people sorry. <laughs> one of the things a lot of people don't realize about DR is you pay for DR out of two buckets. There's pre-disaster money, which is my budget, and there's right. post-disaster money, which is Mark's budget, because my insurance company is with Mark. And so I want to spend as little money as possible before the disaster, and I don't care how much money I spend after the disaster, because that's Your from money. the insurance company. Yeah. So I want to so I want to send everything to the object store, and then when there's a disaster, and you go, and it's a million dollars to move that out of the object store, I go, Mark, write the man a check for a million dollars. <laughs> no, that's a great point, uh, and I, I've got actually a slide to uh, to kind of illustrate that. 
um, you know. <laughs> so here's this exact point, right? Passive mode and active mode is what we're calling that. In passive DR mode, what we do on the back end is we have a minimal instance running in Google, because you don't want to pay more than you have to just to have data flowing into Google and knowing that your snapshots are all moving up there and your, your data is safe and you're ready for a DR scenario. Now, when you declare a disaster, we immediately re-spin that VM as a, as a full-size instance, uh, you know, whatever, whatever size is needed to, to run your workloads. And, uh, and so that's the point at which you are you know, paying more, or your insurance company is now paying more, right? Right. So. so what sort of RPOs and RTOs are you looking at for something like this? Well, you know, it, it, it depends on a couple of things. First of all, we have, in HC3, we have built-in snapshot scheduling, right? And you have to choose your schedule uh, appropriately in, in HC3 on, the, on what we call the ground side, right? Where you've basically decided, okay, we're gonna take snapshots every five minutes. And then those exact same snapshots will be replicated up yeah. to the cloud, right? So you're, you're talking about, you know, what, what are your RPO then is defined by your, your snapshot schedule. Um, RTO, you know, the, the time to, uh, from you make the call and say, hey, disaster, uh, we have to reboot that VM in the cloud, which takes, uh, I don't know, what, a minute or two yeah. or something. Okay. Yeah, um, and, then, uh, and then once that's up, you know, you're, you're good to go to start your workloads, so then your workloads have to start up, so. How, how granular can I make the snapshots? Like, is five minutes the? You could probably go down to, you know, one or two minutes, but, uh, okay. you know, at, at that point, you're, um, it, it depends on, obviously, the pipe that you have available, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, so if you have the pipe for it, you know, you can, uh, you can crank it down probably two minutes. I, one minute would be probably a little aggressive, I think, but, but you can- That'd be the equivalent to turning it up to 11. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So what, where's the management and orchestration for all of this run? Is it? Um, so it runs, so basically, um, the, the cloud instance itself is just HC3. So orchestration is the same thing as what's in the product today. Yeah. As far as orchestration of the DR failover, is that kind of where you're, you're going with that? Yeah, um, yeah so today uh, that is a, a, a call to support the, to, uh, to basically invoke your, your disaster declaration and say, okay, please uh, spin my VM up as, as a full-size VM and, and fail. And, and at that point, uh, it is up to you to start your workloads in, in uh, whatever order they need to be started, et cetera. So, so if you have to call support, is, is there a test facility to make sure they work in the cloud? Yes, so that we, and I think, and Craig will talk a little bit about that, we include a, uh, with the subscription, you have the ability to test your DR plan, and, uh, and that's something that, uh, that's obviously very important to be able to do. So that's, uh, and, and you can also run the, the instance uh, if you wanted to. You could run it as the full instance all the time, and. Uh, migrate workloads back and forth or have them running in both places and, and just to, as a as a sort of way to make sure that 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 functionality is working okay so failover networking is, a, is actually a really important topic as well and there's a couple different methods to make this work and and I'm gonna demo I think at least my favorite method uh, which is uh, via little Intel NUC box over there um, you know you have basically a, uh, all these resources that are running in the cloud, you, you need to be able to use them, obviously. You need to be able to communicate with them once your, your main site has gone down. So what we have in, uh, uh, in, in sort of on the, on the ground side is there's a, there's a tiny VM that handles some of the networking tasks uh, with regards to the, the secure tunnel to the cloud and the VXLAN encapsulation. And that VM is exportable. And so you can export that to either another single node system that you could have at your disaster recovery site, or you could even run it on a laptop. So if you wanna, your building burns down and you wanna head to Starbucks, you can fire this VM up on your laptop and, uh, you know, and, and provide the, a- the, the XLAN tunnel and then yeah, get the UI. Right, you get, you get everything and then you've got uh, access to your network. You could, you know, um, connect it into then a, uh, an access point, for, exa for example. So, 
So let's go ahead and demo some of this stuff because this is actually one one nice. question before the go ahead, go ahead. James. Uh, is your question architecture? Shut up, Howard is always in, in order, so go ahead. Mine is not, so if you have an architecture question, go there before I derail it. Um, go ahead, because now I forgot my question okay. for a second. <laughs> uh, so you've been offering a disaster recovery as a service uh, offering that you're hosting. Yes. Right? Are, so would a customer do one or the other, both? This is intended to replace that. So this will be the new way forward. Yeah, this will be the new way forward. Got it. Uh, can I sandbox off the GCP so I can test recovery without, so I can recover machines that are still running on my site? Because testing that your exchange yeah. server recovers means you have to shut down your exchange server. Yeah. <laughs> You, you actually, uh, you can, and, and the way you would do that is to, the, the, the tiny VM that I mentioned, you could run that on an isolated, uh, you know, sort of local network that still had internet access and, uh, and, and bring that up. And you'd probably want to firewall off those, uh, you, those. You guys haven't built the No, there's no isolation the fencing built in. off, uh, okay. Um, but that is a great idea, and that's something we could look at doing, because that's actually a really good idea to be able to, Test in a sandbox and say, "Hey, does this, does this, uh, does this come up okay?" And yeah, and yeah. and you know, you guys taking, you know, an open source firewall and firing up a VM and creating the sandbox that way would be perfectly acceptable. Yeah. yeah. Who do people pay? Do they pay you and Google? Just you, and you're paying Google? That's a great question. Um, it is, uh, and, and Craig will go through a little bit of that, of those scenarios. But but ideally, and, and well, the way it works is that they pay us, right? They don't have to actually directly interact with Google. Right, so you don't have to go learn the uh, the console or anything like that, or set up a billing account with Google. You you uh, you pay us directly, and and it's also sold through the channel as well. And, and Craig, uh, I think we'll we'll go through that here in, in a couple of minutes. So let's let's do a quick demo of this, um, and because uh, this is actually this stuff demos pretty well if the uh, if the demo works, <laughs> we'll see. So uh, what we have here are two HC3. Uh, instances, as you, as you, uh, you can see, it's, so the, the, the top one here is the, the on-prem SNS, which is actually this machine right here, the single node system running HC3. And uh, at the bottom, we have another instance called HC3 Cloud Unity. This is actually running in the cloud. And what it is, is it, it's basically two instances, just like you can do today. Uh, you, know, you have two instances connected up, replicating to each other and uh, you have the exact same functionality in the cloud. But one thing that's really important to point out is that you guys may not be able to see this, but this IP address that uh, we've pulled up for this machine here, 2.240, is, uh, is on the local network. And the cloud instance is also on the local network, 2.245. And that's due to that, uh, the, the VXLAN encapsulation and uh, the tunneling. So, so this effectively is on your local network, even though it's running in the cloud. And that's the way that these, these VMs work as well. So I'll, let's demo that and, and show you what that really means. So here's. OK, but if my local network goes away, yeah, we need to start building scripts to automate the my local network went away and change the default gateway in the internet path and yeah, tear if, down in, the tunnel. In some scenarios, I mean, and that's kind of why, you know, and I'll demo this, like the, having the, the ability to, um, you know, as part of your DR runbook, you need to have prepared for this and, and understand that, yes, I, you, you will need to have a, a sort of a backup network that you create that can be the exact same configuration as your primary network, but you need to be able to, to create that and then have the, uh, you know, bring up your, your cloud unity gateway, as we're calling it again, so that you, right. it, it can then reconnect into that new network and everything's the same. The, so here's... This on-prem box yeah. is what... The VXLAN that's established between the two, it comes out of this box. So this is set up first. Correct. Yeah, right. you would deploy this box as you would normally deploy yep. HC3, right? You set up a single node system, install your workloads. Then when you enable Cloud Unity, this yeah, this happens behind the scenes. The, the instance gets created. We create that in Google. It's all it's all hidden away from yep. from the user. They just flip the switch. You get the the cloud instance created. Yeah, um, and then the the VXLAN connection is established, and and that network traffic 
um, you know, is basically exists only within that 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 scale instance yeah. that uh, that you're running now for your, your HC3 environment. And you know, the because it's nested nested virtualization, these these L2 VMs yeah. communicate to each other directly from within that one that VM, and those packets never actually even traverse Google's network, right? It's all it's all internal yeah. to that environment, right? And so yeah. the only way that those that those network packets reach your local network is through that secure tunnel. Yeah, this is, but, I like this because one, I don't have to screw around with the VXLAN configuration. Right, you never and, touch it. And two, I don't have to have any middle boxes that are doing that. I don't, yeah. have to, I don't have to deal with it. It's just Correct. done. Yeah, the scale guys have been good at simple for a while. Yeah. Ever since you got rid of GPFS. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a naughty word to say around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the other question around, a lot of people are not fans of stretch layer two computer tests. Yeah. It's bad. Well, I'm glad Yvonne is not here. Because he'd be losing his stuff right now. Well, so the, where do you think I got the dumpster fire line? Yeah. The, so in general, where do I have to use it? Where do I not have to use it? Because I want to use it just to do replication, no more. Okay. And then where can I just shut it off and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't want to run into, especially given the target audience for the overall solution, I don't want to, tr I don't want to troubleshoot layer stretch layer two in a lot of these environments. Right, and, and, and the stretch layer two problems that you'll encounter, you know, you might encounter if you are running workloads in both the cloud and, and locally and expecting, uh, you know, it, depending on the application, you know, who knows what it's doing, if it's doing a lot of broadcast mm -hmm. or something, you know, where you get into, uh, you start sending a little bit more traffic than you really need to across that, that, uh, that tunnel. Um, but, you know, today, we, it is required. Um, on the roadmap, though, will, is the ability to basically set up uh, sort of a soft firewall on the, on the cloud side that would let you communicate with those VMs via other methods. But today, the only, the only method to communicate with those VMs is going to be via uh, VXLAN. Now, I, I think that in, in a full DR mode, you're going to be, you, you will have less problems with the stretched L2 because you're not necessarily having applications uh, communicate. So DR, when we so I get, and we need to specify this because I have end users and business users who confuse DR with HA. So DR, we're talking about hole in the ground. We're falling over data centers, not individual workloads. Correct. Because well, I think then you run it to you. What, you it, could fall over work, fail over a workload, but you would start having some of those problems. The real stretched L2 dumpster fire problems mm -hmm. are when you try and operate. Stretch. And that's what I mean. So when you when we say DR, you got to be careful in saying DR is you know we're not going to fail my favorite SAP over to uh, uh, Google on AC3 and then have uh, all of my middleware running in my data center. No, no, thinking but that it's all one big stretched. But you might, but you might fail over exchange and run right. degraded for a day or two. You can, you could fail over because that, that doesn't, that doesn't that big, interoperate a lot. It's very much more latency you know. insensitive. Yeah, okay. yeah. it is a cool technical solution. Thank you. So, with this uh, example here, you know we've got a a, a Windows twenty twelve instance here running locally. And uh, you know it's just got an IIS server here serving this web page, and uh, you know what we can do is you know, in the example of failing over an individual application, you know I'm going to um, actually that's the wrong VM. I'm going to power this one down. <laughs> I'm just going to power it straight off, and uh, so we'll see this thing shut off here in a couple seconds. And you know, prior to this point, I've had this thing set up, and I've got these VMs set up to replicate. As Jeff demoed earlier, it's a matter of just you know, point and click, replicate. And I've got. And I'm sorry, Phil. The Jason asked us to bring this back up. He wanted to make sure we clarify on the does a uh, failover to AC3 require a support call? Because he says he demos it all the time. Oh yeah, I mean you can you can manually fail over, assuming you don't have the if you're operating in passive mode. Mm -hmm. The support call is required to go from passive to active mode. If, when you're running in passive mode, that instance needs to be reprovisioned as a 
you know, a much larger instance. So that's not something that's currently uh, available in the UI. Now that's going to change, but as of today, it, it does require a support call to say, hey, I'm going to start my, all of my workloads. I need a larger instance. But if you're already active, then? Yeah, if it's already up and running, yeah, you can, you can just point and click and, uh, and fail those over. So yeah, that's a good point of clarification. So like what I've done right now is, is the, that exact thing, right? I've, I've shut down a, a VM locally, and uh, like you would normally do in HC3, I can now on the remote site go away. I can uh, go ahead and click and clone that thing, and uh, we'll power it on. Now I'll just take a couple seconds to start. There it goes. I think I have a ping here running in the background, so we'll see when it starts pinging again. Should be booting up right now. Um, and then also, you know, the uh, just like it does uh, locally with HC3, the web console and all that stuff still works. So you can see here, this VM is actually booting up in the cloud right now. This is the exact same VM that was replicating from uh, from the local site. There's pinging, and it's back up. So I can now reconnect with RDP. And uh, you're back so up and running. So this is actually running in the cloud. What you've just simulated is like, this host right here just died, and I lost all the VMs on it. And so you're booting them in the cloud. It, because it's all similar else, to that. It's all not, else it's is still the same, the same, right? I actually, actually, I'm going to demo that exact scenario. I'm going to, uh, let's, let's uh, yeah. But I mean, my. All of my networking equipment is still up. Right. You didn't change anything yeah, else. To, this is what so Keith mentioned. Where I didn't you're have failing a whole site over failure. One workload, right? I've I've downed a VM. Say something happened to the VM, or you know, I, I you know, who knows, right? You've you decided you want to fail over one VM to the cloud. That's what we've just demoed, right? I've got VM now running in the cloud. Um, in this VM, I, I all I did was reconnect to RDP. That means I'm connecting to the same IP address that it was just on, mm -hmm. right? So this is actually even though it looks like it's on my local network, and I'm still pinging the local 10200.2.247 address, this is actually running in the cloud. So let's, uh, let's demo the actual full DR scenario, uh, as you've kind of described. So I'm gonna go ahead and power this one back down now on the cloud, and we'll delete that VM. We won't need it anymore. And we'll power the original one back on. <laughs> Delete that one. All right, so now we're bringing up the original VM again. We'll wait for this to ping. There it is. Give it a few seconds before we RDP. Okay. So now we're back up running uh, locally again. And uh, let's demo a little bit more of a, of a realistic DR scenario. Uh, I will go ahead and fully unplug this machine so here's the HC3 node, and power's off. So we've, the machine's exploded, whatever. Choose your, pick your disaster. Well, you know my favorite disaster. Thermite, perhaps, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, those other guys took it down off YouTube, so we can do that again. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is kind of my favorite uh, DR uh, recovery scenario, which is this is a, just an Intel NUC box. And uh, I don't know that we would actually ship anything with an embossed human skull on it, but uh, <laughs> this one has that. So, uh, and, and really all this has to be is, is a Linux box that can run a VM. As I mentioned before, you know, we have the, uh, the, the very small, um, uh, what we call the Cloud Unity Gateway. And uh, I've, so what I've done is prior to doing this test, I've exported that VM 
and, and loaded it onto this box, and, and it will run on this box just fine. So ideally what you would do is have this sort of thing handy standing by. You have uh, the private key that's necessary for the, uh, the, the secure tunnel to work, uh, hopefully protected very well, and you can uh, insert that here. And what I'll do then is go ahead and power this thing on. And you know, in a real DR scenario, you may not actually be here anymore. We might be somewhere else powering this on. I'm just going to plug the same LAN cable into this thing. <coughs> we'll fire it up. <clears throat> so that thing is configured to just boot um, and start that VM automatically. So, um, so right now, uh, well, you know, we're going to wait for this. It should take I don't know, maybe 30 seconds or so. But uh, what we'll see is the uh, obviously the the primary cluster is is permanently down, and uh, at some point when that tunnel comes back up, we'll see the uh, the cloud side of things reappear. Hopefully. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, if anybody has any questions. Uh, no, he I just freaked those. James out because the fans went away and he thought he had to go fix something. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading it's something like... a Pavlovian like, response. Like, yeah, yeah, I was reading <laughs> something like walked over there and I didn't know you were about to do that when the fans stopped. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is really, really bad. That's funny. <laughs> this is one of those situations though where I'm never patient enough when I'm waiting for this stuff. It's like, okay, there's got to be something wrong, and you start looking at things, and then it comes yeah, up no, right then. When there's a real disaster and you recover in 15 minutes, everybody goes, "Wow, that was great!" But during that 15 minutes, you're going, "Hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up!" <laughs> That's why you need baselines, right? You know how long everything takes. Yep. So, so you know when you start freaking out. It it doesn't matter. It, you always you know, freak out. I, I know my super micro servers take two minutes from power on till the first thing appears on the monitor. Yeah. And That's a long two minutes. It's a long two minutes. <laughs> and apparently Justin is heckling from the Justin <laughs> from heckling? the future. No. Should be any second now. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah. <laughs> Can you sing us a song whilst we're waiting? I'm sorry? Can you sing us a song whilst we're waiting? <laughs> uh, I'm not prepared for that, especially coming off of a cold. But uh, actually, I should make sure I turn this thing on. I go throw try throw me a math bone since again. we're waiting. Hmm? <laughs> throw me a math bone since we're waiting. Oh, a math bone. Hmm. Let's see. So, server reliability. Okay, hey, I'm listening. <laughs> At how many nodes, and I know what Howard's gonna say in, in response to this, but how many nodes, uh, at what size of a cluster do you need to go from replication factor two to replication factor three? Add three nodes. It's not the second drive failure that will get you, it's the read error on the rebuild that's two orders of magnitude more likely. Yeah, I, um, we actually, uh, I think Brian, one of, uh, one of our engineers here, and he's actually here, he's done a, a lot of uh, modeling of these scenarios as well, and just as far as you know, determining what the uh, probability is of, of certain failure scenarios and, and trying to identify, you know, it, does it make sense at certain numbers of nodes, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, there it is. Hey. Oh. I'm, I'm trying Just to talk. we're going to talk about probability. <laughs> Dr. Everybody gets nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to talk Dr. Rachel and Vanny into joining me on a white paper for that. Oh, that, that would be a great, that would be a great white paper. Oh, is Vanny, like, with me now? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> oh, he likes me better now. 
So here we are, we're, we're now reconnected. Uh, I'll go ahead and clone this uh, Windows VM, uh, just like I did before. And again, this is you know without the uh, on-premises HC3 cluster, is that thing is dead, and uh, we are it's now in full, DR, in full DR mode. What was that, Howard? It's an X-parrot. An X. It's pining for the fjords. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed to its perch. <laughs> All right, so this thing is cloning. So, I mean, this is, this is really cool, in my opinion. I mean, this is, allows you to set up at a new location with, your, with the same network, get access to the same resources, and, and start those back up in the cloud and, uh, and, and fully recover, uh, you know, and, and basically with no additional uh, site needed. You don't need to buy an additional cluster. Um, it's that is that is significant. So I don't know why this clone isn't running. That's the next problem now. How can you orchestrate? Like I want to bring this VM up, this one, these five. How could you do something like sort that? Of workload or orchestration. Yeah. yeah, that's so that's something that's not yet built into HC3. Um, that's on our roadmap and uh, and will be available. Uh, you know, basically in in uh, in both. Uh, the local cluster and the cloud when, okay. we, when we release that. But yeah, that's uh, why we bringing up your VM recognize that. automatically is great. But yeah. and when things like anti-affinity and, and those type right. of uh, relationships that you have to define between different VMs yeah. and your workloads. Um, yeah, that's something that's actually it's it's really important. And yeah, this is this is yeah. all well and good. Yeah. But if you bring up my application before Active Directory is up, I just yeah. it's not doing anything right, for right, me right. yet. No, that's so, that's a have, great point. Have you got a scripting interface for that yet? Um, we we have an API. We don't have any officially supported scripts yet, but they exist. Um, you know, we have uh, sales engineers have created things for customers, and uh, and and uh, and those things do exist out there in the wild. Uh, we're starting to. Uh, we actually just uh, uh, launched a. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it yet. The community website, uh, the Scale Legion community, that uh, we expect will be kind of a. A great location and a great resource for those to sort of scripts to end up, so that uh, any sort of automation or or tools like that that customers and or sales engineers develop are going to be available for for download for. Uh, yeah, I don't even think it has to be a tool, just an API interface that I can orchestrate yeah, using absolutely. my my yeah. service catalog or my runbook or whatever it is that I already use okay. to orchestrate my workloads. So the APIs are available today. I mean, the the UI itself uses uh, APIs. Okay. Yeah. You know, so that's. Uh, that's uh, that's the sort of thing that we uh, we want to make available, and, and certainly for for more advanced users who want to script things automatically and, and do it on their own, lead their own way. Um, you know, that's uh, that's important. So, all right. So this thing should be almost up. With this being a nested solution, what kind of performance are we looking at on the VMs? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, we've. We've been surprised. We've been pleasantly surprised that it's uh, it appears to be minimal performance hit, and in some cases, depending on what your your hardware is uh, on the ground, it might be faster in the cloud. Right? You know, some of the the cloud instances are incredibly fast, especially if you configure it for SSD storage. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's uh, really uh, highly performant even in the cloud. So, and then I would assume the VM restrictions would be the same restrictions as GCP then. Yeah, so the, the VM restrictions will actually be what is what the restrictions are um, in HC3, which is actually, a, um, I think, a, a subset of what's available in, in, right, in GCP. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So this is back up. Um, so me, uh, it's on the network, same IP address. I can go ahead and RDP into it. Um, again, we've completely lost our infrastructure, and now we've got this Windows 12 back up and running on the same IP address. So. That's kind of the idea. Um, you know, you've, uh, you're able to fully recover your infrastructure uh, in Google Cloud with, uh, with this product, so.